Grace, mercy, and peace to you and God our Father and our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, as I was telling the children, is the last Sunday in the church here. And the last few readings, the last few weeks have been building up to this day as we uh, look forward to the return of Christ. And that's the topic of what Jesus is teaching about in Matthew 25 uh, today. <clears throat> but before I get into uh, what Jesus actually says, what he tells us it's going to be like when he returns, um, I want to share a, a, a TV episode that I saw a few years back. A few years back on PBS, there was a, a show called God on Trial. And for some reason, this image always sticks with me because it's such a, a powerful image, and I think it's helpful for understanding Matthew 25. Uh, God on Trial is about a Jewish concentration camp during World War II, a death camp. And the opening scene of, of God on Trial, this TV show, was these Jews were lined up in a long line, and they were walking towards a table with a man sitting behind the table, a guard sitting behind the table. And with a glance, the guard would make a decision. And he would send them either to the right or to the left. And the prisoners knew what this meant. Those who were on one side were going to die the next day. And then those on the other side were going to live. They didn't know which side was which. They didn't know how the guard was choosing uh, whether they would live or whether they would die. But this is what was happening. And if you can imagine what it must have felt like standing in that line, waiting for a, a man you don't know to make with a glance a decision whether you should live or whether you should die, then with that frame of mind, you're ready to, to hear what Jesus says in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, Jesus speaks of the end times, of the day when he returns to judge the living and the dead. Jesus says that on the last day, God will sit on his throne and nations will gather before him. And Jesus says he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. The sheep are to be saved. The goats are to be condemned. Jesus says this is how it's going to be. If you wonder what it's going to be like when he returns, it's going to look like this, he says. For each one of us will either be on the one side or on the other. We're either a sheep or we're a goat. We're either saved or we're condemned. There's no other choices. But unlike the Jews in the concentration camp, we can already know which one we are. We can know whether we will be sent to the right or to the left, whether we are a sheep or a goat, whether we will live or whether we will die. We can know because Jesus tells us the goats will come begging their case to the judge. They will come telling about all the good they have done in their life. They will come bragging that they are a good person or at least they're better than the goat next to them. <clears throat> and a great many of them will be surprised. You get the sense of this in Jesus' words. For although they come before the judge with a laundry list of things they have done, of people they have helped, and examples of how they have lived their life and most of their lives, Jesus tells us what we'll hear. Jesus says the king will say, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Understandably, the, the, the goats may be confused. And instead of hearing God's word in humility, even then they will argue with the God of the universe. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? So let me ask you. If they did all these things, if they remember doing them, if they're ready to give examples of how they have done all these good works, what's missing? 
Why would God condemn them to death? What is it that he's looking for that they don't have? Before we get there, let's look at what he says to the other side, the sheep. He tells them, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. It's interesting to me that both the sheep and the goats have the almost exact same response. The sheep say, those who are saved, they also say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Both the sheep and the goats have the same question. When did we do these things? What's the difference between these two sides? Both have lived their life to the best of their abilities. Both of them thought they were Christian. Both of them came to the judgment expecting to be saved. So what's the difference? Here's the key, I think. When the sheep ask, when did we do these things? They really mean it. In other words, maybe they had been doing them their whole lives. But it never crossed their minds that God might notice. That's not why they did it. They did it simply to serve those around them out of love for their neighbor. And that's it. No hope of recognition. No expectation of reward. And the damned, on the other hand, are very concerned that everyone noticed their generosity and their love for the poor. Especially God. The damned believe that they are the ones doing these things apart from God. They may even believe they're doing these things for God. That's the way it is. Those who believe themselves to be righteous because of their many good deeds, or who they are, or how they've lived their lives, God sends them into the eternal punishment. But those who do not believe themselves righteous those who know that they have no righteousness of their own to offer God, God welcomes them into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus tells us here in Matthew 25. And so it is with us. We who are baptized and marked with the name of Jesus. Through our baptism, God has given us his Holy Spirit, which creates faith in us. The Holy Spirit causes us to, causes the work of God in us. The Holy Spirit causes us believers to serve our neighbors. Both, I don't mean just the neighbors in the address next to you, but those who live and work around you, in your community and nation and world. And when this happens, when God does good works through you, you can be sure that that, that you have nothing to do with it. It's the Spirit of God working through you. Now, I know all too well how easy it is to take credit for such things. I know how tempting it is to give ourselves a pat on the back for any good work that we do. But as often as this happens, we need to drop to our knees in repentance and beg God to have mercy on us for our selfish conceit. But it is so hard to take ourselves totally out of the equation. We want so badly to do just a little bit ourselves. The people that that Jesus was talking to the day when he told this, when he gave this prophecy, they believed that they were righteous because of the good things they had done. And you know what they did? When they heard this, when they heard Jesus tell them that that their, 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 their unrighteousness was going to earn them damnation, They were angry at Jesus. And this was the final straw. They wanted to kill him for teaching, for telling them that they who thought they were so righteous were the least of the righteous. They were unrighteous. And they plotted to kill him. And two days later, that's what they did. This is a hard lesson for us. 
to know that nothing we do can earn salvation, that nothing we can do can increase our rank in God's eyes, but that our righteousness must come only from Jesus himself, and that through his word and sacraments. But this is more than just a lesson. It's pure gospel. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, For God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Foolish and shame and weak. What a shameful thing to hang naked on the cross. What a shameful thing to suffer in agony for hours as the world watched him die. They did kill Jesus. He died that day. But God used what was weak in the world to shame the strong, for God rose back to life on the third day. He rose from the dead in victory over death and sin and the grave. When our Lord Jesus took on flesh, God condemned death in the flesh. And through your baptism, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you also, giving life to your mortal bodies. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. It is no longer you who act, but Christ who acts through you. It is no longer you and I who do good works at all, but Christ who does good works through you. We too will face Judgment Day. We too will take our turn in that line and face our judge. Our God and Lord will look at us to send us either to the right or to the left. And when we do, God, our judge, will look upon us and see only the blood of Jesus, which covers all of our sin, shed for us on the cross. Our Heavenly Father will look upon us, and instead of seeing the sinners that we are, he'll see only his son, Jesus, the Christ. Your sins are forgiven, he'll say. Jesus has paid for your sins on the cross. And then he'll say, come. Come. You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We are blood-bought children of our Heavenly Father and heirs of his everlasting kingdom. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the offering.